Now, from a transportation perspective, again, so that we talk about roads, roads are a critical part of everyday infrastructure. But when we start having a look at the future of the transportation mix, there's all sorts of things. Um, so firstly, no surprise, uh, as we start moving more to sort of either semi or fully autonomous vehicles, they're on demand. Secondly, everything's getting electrified. Um, now, when you're having a look at things like supercharged networks, so you're building out a road infrastructure, um, today the vast majority of cars are going to be plug-in. Um, that's fine, but if you're building a supercharger network and you're spending hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars building out a very, very comprehensive supercharger network that needs to last 10 to 20 years because it's an asset, uh, then you also need to start having a look at the direction of the future of energy and electricity. Um, so, uh, when we have so I sit on Centrica's board, by the way, um, so uh, I know quite a bit about energy. Um, so where we are today, cars are combustion fuel, or combustion engines. Um, we are already getting to the point where, for example, outside of Heathrow, biofuels are getting much, much better. So if you want to fly a plane across the Atlantic like Virgin do, basically we've got biofuels. But realistically, when we start talking about traditional road transport, you're not going to use biofuels. But when we have a look at uh, electric aircraft, boostable lithium-ion batteries, basically will mean that by 2023, we'll actually have the first fully electric inter-regional aircraft. Now, on one hand, that starts changing how you tax them, aside from anything else. Um, but it also means that they get very, very fast. So does that change, basically, how we start using uh, transportation? At the University of Bristol, we've got polymer batteries. So a polymer battery, is a battery for an electric vehicle that charges an electric vehicle to a 400 mile range in about three seconds. So lithium ion basically is, is there's a lot of things happening with lithium ion electric vehicle batteries, um, but there's also an explosion because there's a huge amount of investment going into this space in lots and lots of other sort of electricity uh, uh, battery, battery technologies. Wireless charging, so you've just spent lots and lots of money that's on a supercharger network with that we all plug our cars into. BMW are already producing wirelessly charged small cars. When you have a look at the US Department of Energy with ORNL, they've just created a, a wireless charging plate for cars that, that won't be on number, goes up to about 145 kilowatts. So all of a sudden, we've already got, you can do wireless charging with your phone, but we've now got a path to do wireless charging with cars. So do you now start changing the type of supercharger network that you build? Do you still build a supercharger network that you plug cars into, but you make it modular so that you can now start wireless charging up a highway? In addition to that, if we know that wireless charging is going to be coming through, do you change where you build the supercharger network and how you lay the infrastructure out? After that as well, basically we get bio batteries. Um, so this is sort of where, when we're having a look at the future of electric vehicles, you use electricity in depth. So bio batteries are literally bacterial batteries. Um, they keep going forever. And as they get more efficient, uh, they become part of the energy mix. We've got biohybrid PV, so I've already talked about that. That's where we can push photovoltaics to 50% efficiency. Now, if you're a car manufacturer like Hyundai, or again, BMW, Mercedes, or whatever it happens to be, you're still using a load of lithium-ion batteries, but if you start using flexible uh, photovoltaic materials on maybe the roof of your car, you don't need as many lithium-ion batteries. And as these things start getting more and more energy efficient, you need fewer and fewer lithium-ion batteries, and you also need a different type of charging system. Printed lithium-ion. Um, if you use 3D printing, you can 3D print lithium-ion batteries that are 400% more battery, no more energy density than today's traditional lithium-ion batteries. Which means if you're Tesla, we go from using a queen-size mattress worth of lithium-ion batteries using about 20%. And then we have all sorts. And then we have structural batteries. So this is where, starting in 2030, you don't need batteries. And the reason why you don't need batteries is a company that could be the first one to start to produce a production car um, that has no batteries is Lamborghini. So again, they're working with MIT. A structured battery is a battery that, where the car itself is the battery. So you have, for example, carbon fiber that's embedded in this case with carbon nanotubes. You now have a car that has no lithium-ion battery, has no polymer battery, no solid-state battery, 
no hydrogen fuel cells or any of that kind of stuff. And if you slap some PV, if you slap some solar panels on top of it, the supercharger network that you just spent a lot of money on is redundant. It's good, maybe. Um, when we have a look at autonomous transportation, yeah, everything's going autonomous, whether it's a 500,000 ton cargo ship, whether it's aircraft, um, whether it's vans or drones or whatever it happens to be. However, have you considered this? If you take the brake pedals, or you take the pedals, take the dashboard, and you take the steering wheel out of the car, do you have a car, or do you have a pod? Because you don't have a car, you have a pod. So we are already at the point where the car is dying. That is not lost on Audi, Toyota, uh, BMW, and a couple of others. They are already starting to forecast the death of the car. Now, if you're building a road network, and we're seeing the death of the car, because cars are fundamentally becoming pods, where there's just a black space inside, them, like a lounge, and you can flip in different things, does that fundamentally change where you build the roads? How you build them, whatever it happens to be. Answer might be yes, answer might be no. But nevertheless, death of the car starts changing a lot. Now, one of the things that it changes is this. If you just have an empty space within a vehicle, you can now start designing multi-purpose vehicles. So this is the Toyota e-pilot. Uh, in the morning, it gets back to a depot, they just put in a load of seats, and it's a 10 seat minibus. Um, if it goes on the school run, it puts in four seats. Um, once everyone's uh, got to work, uh, it can swap in something else, it can swap in a office table, chairs, TV, whatever it happens to be. Um, and then once it's done there, you can turn it into a shop. It's an empty space. You can innovate the heck out of an empty space. But if this is now just a multi-use utilitarian vehicle that just occasionally pops back into Toyota's, you know, Toyota's depot for a, uh, for a quick change, does that change how you design roads and layouts and all that sort of stuff as well? Does that change rush hour? I'm sorry, anything else? Uh, now, in addition to that, um, I wanted to start showing you some of the other things that I see around the world. Um, what if we combine train technology with cars? Is there any sound? So, um, is there any sound? I felt choked, congested. I couldn't breathe. I was disconnected from myself and you, and I knew I could do better. Now, I have. This is a Revo, a high-speed, super-urban network, and it is fast. It gives us that time we have forgotten. Freedom to start the day in our own way. things. 
So this, again, is coming out of the US. Uh, it's a fully autonomous hotel room. So rather than taking a plane, you can take one of these, provided it's the right cost. But this now starts changing where you design service stations and all that sort of stuff. Because this thing just rolls in, charges, rolls out. So again, when we start having a look at the future of transportation mobility, there are lots of different things that are sort of possible. Now, whether you use them again, up to you. Um, over in Dubai, though, um, we're sort of going into the sky. Um, so we started testing these um, in 2017. We're now rolling the service out. In, over in uh, Adelaide, where so we've got uh, Uber Elevate basically coming through. But again, uh, as you start looking at the combination of different technologies, so for example, these are electric vehicles. Back to remember that lithium ion batteries are getting much, much better. If you put a hydrogen cell into this, it's a 400 mile range. And there's a company called Sky that's done that. transportation options that we have available to us, even now, let alone in the next 10 to 20 years, is going to accelerate phenomenally. And using these things comes down to the maturity of the technology, the approach of the regulators, the cost of the platform. It also comes down to culture. For example, some people just do not want to get into one Other people do. But you start a 3D print, this is a 250,000 pound one. And this is actually a flying Mercedes. They bought the car. Airbus are building things. But even Aston Martin is sort of producing uh, flying taxis now, at least concepts. When you get to the point where you can 3D print these, bear in mind we're very close, you can take the cost of a quarter of a million pounds flying taxi as a service and you can drop it to about 20,000 pounds. You shovel out the batteries in there, then you need the infrastructure. If you have a look at Uber Elevate, where they've been running programs with Arab and all these other organizations to design flying taxi stations. In addition to that, when we start having a look at different visions across all across countries, we're spending 36 billion pounds on HS2, which does 150 miles an hour. Over in Dubai, we just landed, we just placed a $50 million contract for a train that does 700 miles an hour, basically with a pathway to 2,500 miles an hour. Um, so these are the hybrid technologies. So fundamentally, we have, you know, I think we should rethink uh, transportation. Um, however, um, if we start having a look at transportation in a different way, because everyone always talks about multimodal transportation, go and have a conversation with any UK council, and they say, look, what we want is we want a efficient, multimodal transportation network. But if you're an individual, if you're a consumer, do you want to get in and out of different vehicles? Or is it more convenient to call a vehicle up to the front of the building and then you get out of that vehicle when you're home? You switch everything else outside of this. So again, over in Dubai, but also um, China, Singapore, uh, and India, are starting to push these out. So this is where you're going from multimodal to unimodal. And just like cars, to these particular pods, you can swap anything in. You can have a family entertainment lounge pod. You can have a business office pod. You can have a shop if you want. The hyperpod is the lightmore vehicle at the hyperpod system. If you want to use this, go to buy in 2023. The contracts have already been tendered. The technologies now going through prototypes. It is a comfortable and safe transport mode for passenger and cargo pods. All levitation and guidance systems fit seamlessly underneath. Secure airlocks are at each end. Inside the hydropod, passenger and cargo pods can drive smoothly at airline speeds right to their destination. So the combination of these technologies over in the UAE is going to cut one and a half hour commute between Dubai and Dhabi down to 12 minutes. Now all of a sudden does Abu Dhabi become an economic center that feeds off of Dubai. So now you are starting to spread the wealth. It does, if you live in Abu Dhabi today, you don't work in Dubai. Just like if you live in Manchester today, you probably don't do the daily commute to London. These types of technologies, 
you can deliver Manchester and extend the benefits to London's economic uh, sort of powerhouse status. So you can anywhere in the UK. some time tripping with me. I hope you found it fun. That's it. The future is bright. There's a lot of opportunity to re-envision transportation and everything that we do and how we do. So uh, thank you very much and um, I guess I see it's the bar time now. <laughs> thank you.